Total Dropouts. From lifestyle, fitness, beauty, travel, relationships, and self care, Steph's got you covered. Welcome to your safe space where you can stop what you're doing, relax, and let someone else do the heavy lifting for once. This is the Luxury Dropout Podcast with your host, Stephanie Joplin. What's up, fellow dropouts? This is Stephanie Joplin. Welcome back to the Luxury Dropout Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest joining me all the way from LA, Zach Schnall. How are you, Zach? Thanks for joining us. Stephanie, thank you for having me on. Yes. So your alter ego is DJ Bander. You are a musician, a DJ, a pianist. You've studied classical music. You grew up in Brooklyn, New York. You've got such a vast and colorful history to you. Um, Yeah, absolutely. You amaze me. Every time we talk, I learn something new about you and having you on the podcast, I've learned even more. And I'm just, I'm excited to get to, to ask you all the things I got to pick your brain about today. (laughs) Yeah. So first I want to ask you, um, you know, a little bit about growing up and how you chose this career path for yourself. Cause obviously, you know, going to school for music, you pretty much know early on that that is what you're passionate about, but how did you funnel that into the career that you have today? That's a great question. Well, a lot of people, you know, they see my brand, they see my imaging, and they probably don't know that my background is actually in finance and is actually, it's in political science. So I actually have a a, a double uh, degree finance and, um, and poli sci. I studied at university of Redlands. And then I also did pursue music all throughout my life it was a passion but I um you know coming from two very educated you know successful parents you know they were very clear to me that it had to be a balance of doing music but then also having like a business acumen and understanding you know how to you know monetize it and there was actually believe it or not a period of time where I stopped believing in my music completely and yeah after I, I was doing music a lot in high school but I got a little discouraged for some time because I didn't really have a lot of industry connections. And I actually had a couple of friends that were doing music and they seemed to have all these, in, these family connections that I didn't have. Mm-hmm. So I felt very frustrated. So I went all in with my business actually for a while. Okay. And, um, and then all of a sudden I was like, okay, well that was starting to go well, but I really, really like missed music. And I was like, wait a second, like, this is really, I think who I am. Like I'm really, I am a musician. I mean, I like, doing business and all that stuff. It's important to me. But so what I did was I ended up coming back. I moved back to New York and I actually came back to Los Angeles to get my degree from Musicians Institute, Okay, which really set me on the course that I'm now on today. Now having this established brand as a music producer, because it led me to getting my first digital distribution deal with Sony. Mm -hmm. And it really reconnected a relationship that I had with an old mentor. Um, who I then started interning for, who was a composer at the time on some major films, like um, Hollywood movies. And so I started working as, a, as sort of an assistant to him on that. And from that, it really kind of ramped me back into the path that I'm now in, where I'm doing full-time production and eventually led to starting my digital marketing firm as well. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's how we know each other is through your digital, well, really through Clubhouse, but your digital marketing firm is how you and I work together. Um, for sure. So you, but you did grow up, you know, in school for, for music. And then your parents were like, Hey, you got to have this backup plan basically. And that's how you got into the finance side. That's, is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. I mean, I have some people, you know, my family who have that kind of background, both in real estate and investing. So it was always something that was, I was around, you know, um, it's something that's sort of like in my family culture so I was always interested in it and you know obviously being like a being an entrepreneur and you know a capitalist has always been important to me you know and it's always been a driving factor I wouldn't say it's the most important thing to me but it's definitely up there and it was important to me that I figured out a way to monetize my music I wasn't interested in being like nothing against it but I really wasn't interested in being like a struggling artist yeah just like that, that the only reason I even continued pursuing music was because I had a strategy and a plan for actually turning it into a business. I was going to actually go back into law and I was going to do um, like, um, like law practices, managing real estate firms and, and, and capital management REITs and stuff. So I was oh. like, 
yeah so I, but i was but i was like that wasn't really what i wanted to do either so so i really was able to i was blessed that i was able to kind of come up with a strategy and a plan to you know build up a company um that had services and long before i ever got into digital marketing actually long before there was even an instagram <laughs> not to here but there was i i actually did a lot of um engineering and i did a lot of um early on production for some big labels and some and some big hip-hop artists so that really actually got me the original capital that allowed me to do everything else that i'm doing today so i guess the question is what haven't you done um that's a better <laughs> question my gosh okay so for our younger audience um you know going back to finance let's start with finance so what are some tips that you can give to our younger audience to really start you know there's there's all these young entrepreneurs out there there's TikTok stars and people that mm -hmm. get big on instagram what do you advise them um financially to start doing right away um, that is, you know, something that people that they're 20 or 21, they don't, and they don't know, and they, they haven't been counseled to do so. What do you advise them? You know, the most important thing is it's a, the, the biggest thing that creates wealth is a mental shift from the feeling of wanting to show off the ability to have like goods, like on you, for example, clothing or a nice car, these different things and be excited by the growth of your portfolios, of your accounts, of actually of having capital. That right. it's just as cool to have your money in the bank as it is to have the money on a nice shirt or mm -hmm. you know in a nice car, for example. And when you get people to make that mental shift, what I find is that then they actually get addicted to saving money. They get addicted to adding to their security mm -hmm. as opposed to this bizarre addiction we have in this country of showing what what we can buy so you know what i always try to tell people is that the confidence that you project when you have a lot of money saved is just if not much cooler than pulling up in a nice car it's like that's where people need to understand and that's what i tell young people a lot is shifting into that mind frame of of saving and spending less than they're earning, <clears throat> you know, and if you can do that, you really over the long term, you have no choice, but to end up being financially secure, just yeah. on the sense it's like, you know, with anything else, if you're earning more than you're spending, you're going to have money, you know, so that's a that's big right. part of it. Well, that's what the luxury dropout is all about is my journey from like advertising that I'm quote unquote rich on the outside and right. bro broke out broke as fuck on the inside, you know? Um, so and no, not I love the name, by the way. I think it's you. great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, because like I just was so hyper focused on like wearing Gucci head to toe, having a Louis Vuitton phone case. Like, why do I need a thirteen hundred dollar phone case? Do I really need that? And right. and not in like not having thirteen hundred dollars in my bank account. Like, that's the point. If I had, totally. you know, 50 grand in my bank account, maybe that would be a different story. But like I had to put it on a credit card and I had to make payments on it. It just doesn't make sense. And so when I started enriching myself from the inside, you know, that is what makes the biggest difference and that's why i think you are going to be such an asset to people listening because they don't have the tools sometimes like for example nobody explained to me about the importance of your credit no one told me about that you know and so i just happened to get a credit card when i was 21 i opened a bank account and they were like okay here's a credit card you have 500 dollars limit and like i would pay the minimum like no one ever told me pay it off like no one ever said and now I have like, you know, I have excellent credit, but I had to learn that by myself over time. Um, you know, and that's just one, another thing I would advise young people to do is, you know, open a credit card, make those payments on time, pay it in full and build up sure. your credit score because that's how you're going to do everything else in life. Get a home, get a car, you know, all these, all these kind of things. So absolutely. No, absolutely. You know, and I think some people are starting to, you know, I, I, you know, I recently went to this little conference that was about like Forex trading and stuff. And I really was kind of really excited to see there was a lot of really young people there, you know, cool. um, late. Yeah. Like from as young as 19 to like 25. And they were all really like intent on learning about the industry of finance and learning about. So I think that there is a, there is definitely um, some of that happening out there in society, but Again, we know statistically that as a culture, the United States is far behind where a lot of these other countries are. Even though we have a lot of money in this country, mm -hmm. the actual, the individual wealth is actually not as high as you would think, you know? 
something like 40 something percent of Americans like have no emergency fund, you know, and most yeah. Americans like 58 percent are like months are check to check. And yeah. so, you know, that is definitely a problem long term mm -hmm. for just, you know, it's not just so people have their own independent future the like literally the 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 strength of the entire country is at stake if we can't get people to be more financially sound you know we're right. just going to always be dependent on government support things like that you know yeah so really the takeaway is stop spending your money and save it <laughs> yeah i always yeah. tell people like you know eventually you want to it's it's great to have nice things you know like uh i enjoy my nice place and i have a nice car but mo what I tell people, the most important thing is like, I never spend any of my principal to have those things. All of the nice things in my life that I own come from cash flow from investments that I've made so yeah. that the principal is secured both in my portfolios as well as in my different companies to my different assets. And then what, whatever I don't feel I need to save, I then can enjoy and use for like my place and for different stuff. So that's right. the difference, you know, and that's, that's where it's important to understand and you know, when I make, you know, I haven't increased my spending per percentage of my income ever. And that's how I built wealth is that I don't, you know, when I make a new deal, I'm not like, oh, oh, now I can increase my spending. I don't increase <laughs> my spending at all. And right. that, and that's like, again, it goes back to what I said first, which is a mentality shift, which is that confidence doesn't need to be, I don't need to buy a new Hermes belt for everybody to know I'm doing my thing. I don't care. I don't need you to know. I can just, you know what I'm saying? Like I can yes. just rest peacefully at night knowing that I'm just saving my money, you know? And that's where people need to kind of get into that mind frame and don't worry about impressing other people. Like right. they're not going to be there for you when you run out of money. So yeah. why look out? You know what I mean? No, so. they're not. Absolutely. You're going to be exactly. more alone than ever. So exactly. They were there for the wrong reasons in the first place. Um, and that I've learned, I've learned that in relationships too. Like, you know, men that I've dated and I've supported financially, unfortunately, um, in the past, you know, cause I'm my, my love language is gift giving. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would love a person by saying, Oh no, I got it. I'll take care of it. Oh, you can come live with me. Don't worry about rent. Like, Oh, you need help with your child support. No big deal. I got it. Like all stuff that you I feel like a lot of women show their love um, in that way. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> really, it's pretty funny up way to learn but I that's how I learned um but when you know when when that runs out and and to be honest like that doesn't make them not cheat it doesn't make them stay it doesn't make them not break up with you it's just like you know and then you're, you're in the end you are left feeling like super used and you're like but I gave you all of this stuff and they don't care they don't of care. course <laughs> so it's a good lesson to learn um and yeah. I'm, ex I'm exposing myself but it's it's for a good cause <laughs> Um, so I know like on clubhouse, you talked a lot about stocks and you were giving a lot of, um, great information about, you know, investing your money. And I, I personally don't know anything about that part of, you know, finance at all. What are the first steps, um, you know, that like, what, what is the research that needs to be done when you want to invest in something, invest in a stock? Like what, what kind of research, how do you stay in front of the trends or how do you look at the market? Like what, what can you give as an advice, as some advice for that? So the first thing I recommend to people is like, well, I, I first of all, I invest in stuff I understand. Mm -hmm. So if it's a product I don't understand, no matter how many people tell me that the stock is so hot, I won't buy it. For okay. example, many, many years ago, people recommended to me I should buy I should buy um, like Lululemon and a couple of these makeup companies. Well, I'm a guy. I'm not a not mm -hmm. big aficionado on makeup. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I have no passion behind it, and so therefore I wouldn't invest in it because even though I, I probably like missed out on a good investment. If I don't understand it, I don't have a passion for exactly the use of it and the mechanics of it, I won't invest in it because if the stock starts going down, I won't be able to tell you why it's going down mm -hmm. versus something that I understand and I'll understand why something is not working. And therefore, I have better ability to know if there's a bottom coming. Okay, so getting back. So what I do is I look for a couple things. I like to look for products that i believe what i always tell people in clubhouse i invest in things that do that do well in good times and even better in bad times so okay. for example i have a huge position in campbell's soup seems random but cpb is one of my hugest holdings why 
Well, because when the economy is good, <laughs> people are buying kitchen, kitchen goods and they buy soup. Yeah. And when time is bad, all of those people that now can't afford restaurants who are <laughs> online, they go right away and buy Campbell's soup. That's so, so funny. <laughs> so I have a security blanket knowing that when the economy goes down, that that product is actually going to be sustained and is going to be needed. So, right. you know, other, other investments that I'm in like that would be, for example, like AT&T, um, even though I'm in a little bit less because they're having some issues with their dividend. <laughs> but, you know, for example, I know in bad times, people are not going to cancel their phone bills. You know, people are going to still need their phone bill and they're going to need their phone line. And so, you know, you have to ask yourself if the economy, if, if you were down to like, let's say you had to take a 40% cut in your income, you know, what is something you absolutely would not cut spending on, right? Housing, right. right. your phone and low and, and, and low priced food goods. Right. So that's what I have the bulk of my money. In. I have my bulk of my money in, in affordable housing. I, I invest in HUD housing. Um, both in the stock market and in real life, I buy and sell HUD properties. Okay. And, um, you know, REITs, for example, which are real estate investment trusts, which are basically like stocks that represent real estate. And I look for properties that are in, in markets that I believe are very strong in both economic times. So like I'm a big believer in, for example, senior housing. So I own a lot of like SNH, which, which, which is because when... In bad economic times, young people usually lose their housing because they lose their jobs, but yeah. older people don't because they're on social security. Right. So like investments that are kind of more government based and government funding. So, so that's sort of like how my brain works in terms of looking for investments. But what it really comes down to is doing your own research, learning about the mechanics of stocks, what, you know, what a stock is, what a bond is, you know, I can yeah. explain that before. Um, I really love bonds. I'm big. Into, I have more bonds than I do stocks, actually. And um, I, you know, I just believe in really researching and studying what these things are. Not like what's the best stock to pick, but what is a stock? How do you, what is dividend income? People, a lot of people, I explain, people didn't realize that I actually make income from my stock investments without having to sell any stocks. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that most of these companies actually pay you to hold on to their stock. And you can actually turn that into a major income stream. So wow. it's important for people to research that and understand that's what a dividend is. Okay. So, you know, and that's why you could actually make money in the stock market, whether it goes up or down, because unless the company goes, becomes insolvent, many of these companies will always pay a dividend. So for example, AT&T is an example. I never sell my AT&T in, in, unless I feel I'm over-invested in it, but I always keep some of it. And when there's a big market crash, that's when I buy more. So it, the, the real key is buying into downturns, not freaking out and selling into downturns. It's like okay. you wait for the crashes to invest more. And then you continue to, whether a stock goes up or down, if it has a dividend, you'll continue to make money with it. Because that's how you can buy the, them for less, right? Because they've crashed. You can buy the shares exactly. for less. Just not worrying. Like I'm big into these corporate bonds. In 2008, when we had the big crash, the bonds lost 42% of their value but mm -hmm. they maintain their dividend. So okay. for example, every amount, whatever amount of money you had in it, every month, you still got your income check. And so you just, if you were smart, you just didn't, you, you didn't even look at it. You said, oh my God, okay, the number's down, but I'm just not going to stress on it. You collect your check and you just let it ride all the way back up. And now all of those funds have returned to where they were before the 2008 crisis. And if right. you're really smart, you bought into them during that time and you would have more than doubled your money by investing in the downturn. So, it, you know, it's just about reading. I recommend like a lot of really good books, like, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And like I tell people, if you're interested in stocks, well then start watching CNBC and, and download the app on your phone and, you know, watch these news channels and learn um, what they're talking about. And if there's a term you don't understand, Google it, you know? Right, right. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That's so mm -hmm. helpful um, because, like I, you know, like I said, there's certain things that I just never was taught about. And I know that there's a lot of people like me. I mean, I'm in my thirties and I don't know about it. So I can imagine nope. people are in their twenties. No, <laughs> yeah. You're not alone. I'm, I'm kind of the guru, you know, I just happen to come from, uh, you know, a family and a background that like were people really into stocks and it was something that was talked about at the dinner table, talked about, you know, and, and if you don't come from that, it's very difficult to, they don't teach you in school. Um, mm -hmm. We're a very kind of 
you know, uh, we're mediocre when it comes to economic education in this country. And we're, and it leaves people very credit dependent and job dependent, which is kind of on purpose, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Definitely. The funny thing is my parents are very educated financially and they have, you know, like they have these capital investors that they use and they have like a certain amount of money that they pull out every year to, to, you know, use and they budget from that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, my sister and I were laughing because we were like, if they, God forbid, were to pass away, we would probably walk into that probate office and like not know what the hell was going on because they just like kind of keep us in the dark in a way. Like it's weird. Like they don't want us to have to worry, but I'm, right. but my sister and I are like, we want to know, like we want to be knowledgeable about these subjects, but I think they're like in a way trying to protect us, but I, I wish they would involve me more. Yeah. Um, the more interest you show and learning about it, and maybe you can tell them that I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm helping you understand it. It's very, it's, it's a weird thing in this culture. It's like my, my, my family was similar. Like my father really didn't talk to me much about he did. And he didn't, when I started making my own money and started my own business, all of a sudden, now it's like, he can't wait to tell me about the deals he's working <laughs> on going on. It's like, like almost like, you know, wants to show me that he's still wheeling and dealing out there. <laughs> Before I was doing all these things with my businesses, he was kind of quiet about it. So sometimes it's like, it's just weird. We don't, you know, parents don't really know how to approach it. They, you know, if they, if you have parents who are very successful financially, they may feel like, oh, I don't want to, them to know how much money we have, um, you know, or they feel like, you know, and, it's, and a lot of, there's a lot of very wealthy people that actually don't have any idea how their money is managed or, or what. They're just good at saving. They're just good at not overspending, but outside of that, they really have no clue what they're doing. And so um, that's also an issue. And that's partly how some of these big funds make so much money is, is that people just hand them their money and they're like, okay, like, you know, and they just collect their monthly check. Personally, oh, yeah. I- They, I they go the to every, like they go to a meeting with them once a month. Like they're very on top of it for sure. Well, that's, well then that's, that's a good, that, I mean, that bodes well, you know, yeah. um, you know, I, I manage all my accounts myself, but I'm mm-hmm. very like on- almost to the point of being like OCD, like I'll (laughs) notice and he has moved in anything anywhere. Like (laughs) it's it's almost a little neurotic. That's Uh, okay. Yeah. But that, but that has helped me definitely like, you know, I I recommend people to be like that when it comes to their finances, like don't just check out, you really got to stay on top of it. Don't trust anybody. There's no one you can trust with your money, but yourself. It's one of those things with money where it's not, it's not like, Hey, can you show up next week and walk my dog? Hey, can you like, you know, can you remember to pick this up from the post office for me? That's some, some people treat their money like that. Like, Hey, can you just let me know how much I have in this account? I don't want to deal with it. I'm not good with money. You just tell me. And that's how (laughs) unfortunately people get scammed, you know, like Mm -hmm. that's, that's how people get scammed. And sometimes you get scammed by institutions. So it's important to stay involved. Oof. Yeah, I know that. I mean, it's true because some people just they don't, you know, they're not of the generation that balances their checkbook. So they go by what is on, you know, like their chase app or whatever. And sometimes they don't notice that like a hundred dollars is gone here or a hundred dollars got charged here. And, you know, they right. don't, don't notice. So I, I definitely keep on top of that. Um, my sister, she's younger than I, and she, um, she actually balances like physically balances her checkbook, which is just cute. so going away from the financial stuff going uh, I want to talk about marketing and branding and um, how you branded yourself personally Uh, Mm -hmm. I guess you know when you were first starting up and you first decided okay I'm going to go into marketing I'm going to go into branding myself all of those things like what were your first steps Um, what were your struggles Um, like what was your game plan because I know you had a vision for it yeah, no. So I started, you know, the first thing was learning how to create a brand name and that was unique and that um, really kind of, I was able to get SEO control over. So obviously okay. like Bander was something that I had used as like an acronym since I was young as a, when I was a hip hop producer and stuff. But I realized soon that Bander by itself, like was actually, there was oil firms in Saudi Arabia that used Bander for a completely unrelated thing. Okay. And because there's, wealthy there it was very difficult to compete with them in the SDO. so right. i so at that around that time i actually just happened to start dj because i was originally only a producer and composer 
But I had all these friends who were like, man, you should learn how to DJ too. So you can like perform your songs out at festivals. Mm -hmm. So that's when I was like, okay, so I'm going to go with DJ Bander and Bander Productions. And I just went all in with those. There is no other DJ Bander and there's no other Bander Productions. So I just flooded the internet with content and with press and with music and with partnerships mm -hmm. that I created, which, which over time um, basically gave me all of the Google locked in SEO that I needed to establish the brand online. Okay. So some of that, you know, <clears throat> I come from the school where like now you can kind of, you know, you can finance that you can finance that SEO. You can finance that. I did it before you could do it that way. I did it from, I actually did it from the mud, as they say, like I did it from actually just having to put out content on my own. I had to right. just literally brand myself so much and put so many things out there myself um, and stay so active on social media, like hashtagging DJ Bander, DJ Bander. D For years, I had to do it. <laughs> Eventually, it got me a Google panel eventually it led to Facebook verification and then into Instagram verification, all that stuff. Right. So, you know, what I try to do now is help clients, you know what I'm saying? Like to take what took me close to like eight to nine years to basically do manually to like a year or two to mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and that was sort of the original thing. And honestly, the digital marketing stuff came much later in my career. Like I, the reason I got into it is because I was realizing, I was like, wait a second, there's so many scamming hustlers out here saying that they can do verification and they can do Spotify. They can get you fans. And it's, and it was so much BS yeah. that I was like, and it was so expensive. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait a second, this is, this can't be. And because I think I already kind of was established financially, I was like, wait, let me just basically charge, let me try to figure out how they do all this stuff and charge like half what all these people are trying to charge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need to like rob all these people. Like, yeah. I already, money. like I was already wealthy before I started the digital marketing company. Right. So like my goal is like, I was like, let me create a company that has a great value add that competes with all these gigantic PR firms, but mm -hmm. that's priced at a boutique price. And, and that's how I think I found my success and I got my clients because I'm like, they're like, wait a second, like I could spend this much with Bander and I'm getting the same thing I'd spend like three times the amount doing with somebody else. Right. And so, yeah, so that's, that's really what it got me into it. And then just the curiosity of wanting to also make sure that like, for me, I have no interest in fake marketing. I have no mm -hmm. interest in like, it does no good to get people fake followers or to get yeah. people fake dreams online, because at the end of the day, it will just not lead to anything, you know? Yeah. So I think I learned about it because of the goal of just wanting my music to be heard. Really? Absolutely. I, yeah. And, yeah. And I've been doing it. Like I've told you, I've been doing social media for 10 years. I think the problem with me is that I rebranded myself so many times during that process that when yeah. I finally got to Stephanie Joplin and now the luxury dropout, I had to like rework everything. Cause I had, like I've told you before, a mostly male audience because I was a sports journalist. I was covering MMA, you know, right. I was, you know, like I was posting more sexy, sexy type, like of content. And I right. wasn't really being vulnerable. Like I wasn't being vulnerable and saying like, oh, I kind of feel today. And like having that resonate with other women or, you know, whatever I would talk about anxiety, weight loss, depression, like all of that stuff, like that I talk about now, I would never talk about before. Cause I, I didn't think that was sexy and I just couldn't, I couldn't be vulnerable. Like I didn't want yeah. anyone to think they could break me. I can't be like that. You know, that was my mentality right. at the time. Um, but that's where I found the success now where, you know, it's still slow. I mean, it's still like with your help, it's been better, but it's just been, you know, still a slow process process to translate that to like turning it around and having a more female uh, based audience. The engagement from the females are great, but it's still, you know, 80, 20 when it should be, you know, 70, 30 or whatever it is. So, yeah, as I, as I tell you, and I tell all my clients and everybody I work with, you know, there's no magic bullet to creating a fan base. I mean, even, even me, I still continue to work on it. I think how I've been able to maintain and grow my base is by the fact that I, I focus on a balance of, of, I think the key is it's like content that people love, 
and then also projecting a lifestyle that people want to connect to and enjoy. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they want to connect to what you're going to provide, what new, what new content you're going to, whether it's a song or it's a podcast or it's a video. And then they also want to, you know, be inspired by something that, 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 that keeps them entertained and keeps them connecting. I think we live in a very dis, this sort of dissociated kind of almost like lonely time. And so I think where what people need to think about when they're building their brands online is creating something that's like that that gives people a sense of comfort mm-hmm. and identity that they can that they can connect with. Yeah. You know? Yes, and definitely. More and more from Instagram and social media and less and less from TV, you know? Mm-hmm. So in a way you have to see your brand as like your own TV station. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how you look at it. Like I always make a joke when I tell my clients, when I post something, I look at, I, I, I always wanted to, I imagine like an HBO presents like, like the little thing <laughs> come and right before Sopranos would start. It was like the best yeah. time of the, you know, I wanted to feel like HBO presents right before my post. Uh... And yeah. And to do that, you have to create a combination of like you're hustling, but you're relaxed. Mm-hmm. So you don't over post. Mm -hmm. but you don't also check out and disappear. Yeah, no, definitely. I struggle with that because I, I, you know, all these things that I've been taught, uh, taught, I guess you could say are, you know, don't like, you've got to post once a day or once every other day. If you go one, you know, if you go too long without posting, then the algorithm's going to kick you out. And, you know, like all these things like about the algorithm that changes like every day day and you can't even keep up with it anyway. But yeah, it's, it's like definitely been, um, insightful, um, you know, us chatting about strategy and, you know, like last night you were telling me, like, I was like, Hey, which one should I post? Which picture should I post? And you said, don't post the way you think it needs to be post from your heart, like post what you want to post, post what you feel good about. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's like, people don't realize people are so worried about what other people think is cool. Yeah. And that, that would like, you have to trust in your own vision for what you think is dope. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, otherwise it's not going to be original. It's not going to be you. Like, you know, you have to go in with, you know, and, and I understand a lot of, I hear that too. in a lot of clubs and I've gotten into these debates with a lot of people about, Oh, you got to post a bunch. I mean, I do think you should be regularly active on Instagram, but like, what, what I think is important is that there's a re, there's a there's something important that you're talking about when you post, mm-hmm. you know, like if you guys, if you if your mm-hmm. listeners watch the latest Instagram, like I posted like a, this kind of random thing at a sushi restaurant. It kind of doesn't really even have a logical explanation for why I did it, but it's just a lifestyle thing. But the caption is about something very specific. I just mm-hmm. got 50 streams on my new song that dropped a couple weeks ago and it's still going up from there Mm -hmm. that was the reason i was posting but i didn't want to post like a screenshot of it people can go ahead and look they'll see the numbers themselves so so what i noticed what i what i tell people to do is it's like have reasoning behind what you do like if you want to post five times in a row within one week okay cool but like it should be about a reason like for example like let's say i went to a, a a convention and at the convention, I met three big celebrities and I closed two deals at the convention. Well, there you go. That's a reason to post five different times about the same convention. Yeah. Post with this celebrity, then post with this one. You know, but I'm not a fan of just posting for the sake of having new content up there. I think people get fatigued. I know like I don't want to open my Instagram and see the same person dropping something every day. If you're going to do that, then the content really needs to be fresh. You know, I do follow a couple influencers who I like, you know, one, one, I'll give a shout out to him, Mr. Organic. He's cool. He's a, he's like a clothing designer and he raps. He okay. posts a lot, a lot more than I would post. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Some of his posts, they don't even numerically always do that well, but what, what I, res- what I, what I respect about him is that every post is an original, really cool piece of video content. He has like a full-time YouTube video crew with him and he's constantly shooting videos with his cars, with his, with his house, all this stuff. So even though he posts more than say, I think is necessary to post, it's not redundant or boring because each post yeah. is a content. You get it? 
Yeah. Yeah. And of course, like I'm, you know, you had said to me, like, you need to take more pictures. Like, you know, that's something that you and I had discussed right when we first started working together. And I'm like, I know I'm like, the only thing is, is like, I, you know, I always take them myself, like with a Bluetooth clicker. So I have mm -hmm. reached out to photographers and then we'll do photo sessions and, you know, the beach one, obviously that I just did, it's a little difficult to post too many in a row of like those because they're pretty redundant, but, um, I could post a couple and then maybe down the line post more. Um, but I have another shoot Saturday, so that'll be in the mix. Um, but it's just like, it's a lot for, it's a lot for a woman to go through sometimes. Like, you know, when you want to do like a nice looking photo shoot, you got to get the makeup done. You got to get your hair done. You got to choose an outfit. Like it's like this whole production. And I know it doesn't always have to be that way. Cause I've lived off my own content forever. Um, right. it's, it's actually nice to have proper headshots to send in for press stuff. Like even like the stuff that you and I've been working on for press, like, you know, the photo shoot that I did a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, Oh, like now I can use that, those headshots for this article, which, so that's been helpful anyway, yeah. good to have in your pocket. I mean, what I do with my goal with, with what my company does is it focuses on increasing real engagement with what you already have up there. Mm -hmm. I would rather have a post, one post a week that does really, really well mm -hmm. and used to drive traffic to your brand <clears throat> than constantly having to have new pictures. Like I right. would, I, I'll just leave one photo and I'll keep running promo on it. Like, and using that one photo so that, I like when people go to my page, every post to me has to have thousands of likes mm -hmm. and hundreds of comments because then it's showing, oh, there's real engagement. And this dude actually, when he puts something out there, people respond. Mm -hmm. And there's also an element of like, I, I want people to know that I'm busy. Mm -hmm. I'm busy. I'm running three companies and I have a lot going on and, and I don't have time. I'm not just sitting around and worrying about what content I'm posting. <laughs> like there might even be a couple of days where I don't even have time to post anything on Instagram at all. Like there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, it's okay to be busier than being able to post about what you're doing. You know, you are, you are a pretty busy guy, I feel, but I, you know, yeah. for, for me with my audience, I feel like they, like, if I don't post on my Instagram stories, they miss it. They like reach out to my friends. Hey, Stephanie. Okay. Like what's going on? And they almost like miss it. And so I don't, it's not that I feel obligated. It's that I feel needed sort of. And I'm like, okay, like this is a great opportunity for me to reach people and, you know, advise them to the best of my abilities. And I, I have that too. I've gone, you know, um, a few, a couple months ago, I had a family friend pass away and I decided out of respect to go kind of like silent on Instagram for like three or four days or five right. days. I can't. And people were really shook. Like people were DMing, <laughs> like, what's going Like, where's the content? Like, where's Vander? <laughs> so I have that too. Like I have people that I'm like, really? Oh my God. You people are really melting. Cause I like not posting. Like that's so cute. Like, <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, sometimes it could just be like, yo, sometimes it could just be a meme for the day. It could be, you know, um, you know, one little thing and then a uh, picture of a sunset or, or a bit, you know, it doesn't always have to be, you know, um, uh, you don't always have to be like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, I don't have any content right now. What am I going to do? Like, if you don't have any content, it's okay. Let's focus on blowing up what you do have out there. So you know? where do you, where do you stand on? Like, if you're trying to build your brand, like in your, you're in the building stage, like you don't have very, you know, you don't have like an established brand. You're not verified yet. That type of thing. Where mm -hmm. do you stand on posting polarizing content? Like for example, you're pro or anti-vax or you're pro or anti-abortion or think like something that's extremely po polarizing like that. Where do you stand on it? I think that, I think that, you know, personally, it, now this is a very difficult decision that I've made because mm -hmm. I have very strong opinions politically and culturally and all this stuff. Yeah. But what I realize is that, you know, you have to be really careful with posting about all that stuff because, you know, you might have somebody who's a big supporter of you, who's very powerful and can do a lot for your career. And you could post something like, you know, I like Biden or I like Trump. And that guy likes Biden or that guy likes yeah. Trump. And now, guess what? Now he doesn't like you, does he? You know? Oh. And now you just burned a relationship with somebody that you could have completely avoided by just not bringing that up. And now that's also, you know, the, you know, I, I, I get 
conversation a lot with, with my parents, actually, because my parents were very politically active in the 60s, mm-hmm. you know, and they kind of think I should be more active and talking out there with how many followers I have. Like using your but platform. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like how come, you know, I don't step, you know, like I don't really get into it. Like I, you know, I'm very careful, you know, not to make any of my political affiliations public, you know, like during the elections, I only encourage people to vote. Right. You know, things like that. So I will speak out on stuff, but not specific. I think that, you know, when you're not just when you're building your brand, but even when you have an established brand, you know, you, you know, you will pay a price for taking a strong stance on either side of any big issue. Yeah. You're going to pay a price for that. So people <laughs> have to ask, is like that worth it to them? If yeah. you, be, you have to be somebody who believes that like being, being like strongly worded about your beliefs is like the most important thing to you. And you don't care about any other thing that it could cost you, including financial hardship or (laughs) fans. You like, that's what I tell people, like be prepared for the rainstorm. If you Mm want to bring it like that, uh, more power to you. You got guys like, you know, famous comedians like Michael Rappaport, you know, he he puts his views right, but he pays a price for that. I like him, but he does. Exactly. You know, I like him too. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, you know, if you look through the comments, it's, in, you know, would you, I wouldn't want to wake up to that every day. I, I wouldn't even look at my comments. I wouldn't even look. You would, you're going to, you're, you're also inviting the crazier people when you start doing like that. I so I kind of like that a little bit of mystery. I don't believe, you know, look, if I thought that, you know, my opinion on something one way or another could really make this consequential difference in world affairs by speaking on it, then I would think differently, of you know? Course. But like, you know, um, I have an established brand and I have a few hundred thousand followers, which is not insignificant, but do I think that I could like sway an election or do I think yeah. that, you know what I'm saying? Like sway a social issue with the Supreme Court? No. So then yeah. why, why give myself that vulnerability when I don't really have a lot of leverage anyway to make a big right. difference? So that's how I look at it. I agree with you hundred um, percent. I had someone ask me on my, ask me anything like, oh, I don't know whether or not to get vaccinated. And I'm like, I am not answering that question with how I actually think I'm going to tell you how you should think. And that is you should talk to your loved ones and the family that you're around and make a decision based on that. And that's yeah. it. I'm not going to say whether I'm pro or against, because I can't, I literally cannot tell you what's best for you. How would I ever know that? you know? Right. So exactly. I know what's best for me. That's what I, that's all I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so tell me about like networking and stuff like that. Obviously, mm-hmm. you know, for a lot of people, it's difficult um, to put themselves out there and, you know, in, in a place like LA, it might be like a little bit, might be a little bit easier. Like you can go out and maybe like network a lot easier than you can in like Cleveland or something. Um, what is a good way that, you know, if you're in a smaller town and, you know, you can use the internet, like whatever, or, you know, use meetups or go out to clubs, like what do you recommend? recommend for people who are looking for connects and like, you know, would you recommend engaging with them online or how did you make your connects? So, yeah, uh, I would recommend using, utilizing all that, but be very careful with people that you can meet online mm-hmm. as someone who's like dealt with people not being who they say they are online. You have to really be careful because there's just a lot of scammer type people out there mm-hmm. and they can't oftentimes take advantage of people through the internet and finding right. people that way outside of social circles. So, so you have to use some caution with that. Um, I've, I've utilized, you know, um, I mean, I, people find me through social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, I utilize clubhouse, you know, how we met and, and I, I utilize those rooms because I think they're a nice way to do that as COVID gets better, hopefully over the next six months to a year, you know, definitely people need to be out there. Yeah. The, uh, you know, uh, investing and establishing your brand will help you get more traction with the people who you meet when you're in social situations. Cause you know, you right. hand somebody your card or you say, Hey, follow me on Insta. Obviously the bigger of a footprint you have, the more likely that person's going to DM you and be like, yeah, yeah. I show you night. Like, uh, yeah, let's definitely connect and let's work. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to do there. You have to do all things. You have to be out there networking, you have to be networking online. 
um, and then continuing to create content, which people will then see, which gets engagement. So it's kind of like working multiple cylinders at the same time is what it comes down to. So I'm going to ask you an interesting question because as, as a woman, um, who like, I would say I'm an attractive woman. I'll say that. So when you're an attractive woman and you want to network with a man, right. And you're sliding into their DMS as a attractive woman who they do not know, what is the best approach to make sure that that man knows that you're there for strictly business? And what do you do if he starts to hit on you? What's your advice? Yeah, well, that's always an issue, obviously, you know what I mean? There's always this sort of like unknown connotation when you're, when you're, when people of the opposite sex are like talking and doing business or whatever is like, oh, is there, is there another there there? Or is there no there there? I think for the most part, people are, is best to kind of like not really overly think it in the okay. sense that it's, you know, I mean, I think that, that the problem is, is that like when you when you're when you're attractive, there's always going to be that element there. And so you kind of have to kind of assume that there's a possibility that any guy that you're talking about may have those thoughts or may possibly try to have those interests. And you just have to simply stay focused on what is it your goal in the networking situation? Like, is there a specific reason you're reaching out to that person and just keep the conversation about that without having to necessarily be cold because right. you know um this is a very very complicated interesting thing you know like uh, you know i've dealt with this in the past like in my in my relationships for example where you know there are some people who it's like they only really want to do business with you if they have this sort of like in the back of their mind like oh well yeah, but they might also like me a little ah, <laughs> and it's the thing that it's not that if you're too, it's a thin red line, because if you're too warm, well, then they can just, you can kind of wash away the whole original reason why the person is reaching out to you. And then it just becomes that. But if you're too cold, then the person kind of feels a certain type of way. Mm. And then they don't want to work with you. Mm. And it's, it, I, you know, listen, it's not easy. It's definitely a difficult thing. Yeah. Um, struggle with it over the years. Yeah. No, 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 for sure. You know, like I've, I've struggled with it with like how I've built my brand, um, you know, and, and how I have to, you know, engage and stuff like that. And now that I'm verified, I have to be even more careful because yes. everything is scrutinized. And, you know, when you're, once you're a verified public figure, celebrity, whatever you want to call it, you know, you have to be very careful about how you speak to people online mm -hmm. because yeah. you lose your check and you can Screenshot. like, <laughs> Yeah, people can really come at you a certain type of way. Uh, so it's a great question, you know, um, and it's not an easy answer, you know, to be honest. Um, you know, I think, especially because it's like, there's certain men especially are really bad with social cues, a lot of them, you know, like, I don't know why, like, I you don't you know, say, <laughs> you don't yeah, say. <laughs> I've always been like, pretty like, I, I've, I, it's kind of weird, like, I, like, women have always been like, like, oh, you're so good at social cues, you're so, you're so you, you always get what's going on like I I guess maybe it was because I was raised by like a single mother for the most part and mm -hmm. she raised me around of like really strong women who really like told me and put me on the game when I was young and I think a lot of guys like didn't have that kind of upbringing or something you know and I had like <laughs> really tough like a really tough older sister who was like was like kept it super real with me my whole life yeah. and I guess there's a guys that don't had didn't have that upbringing so they're clueless out here yeah. so yeah so you're just gonna have to it's it's there's there's really i don't really have a perfect answer for it other than you know you're gonna have to find out what works and you know don't be afraid if if a conversation starts getting weird to you know keep it real with them you know and sometimes the you know you have to have that conversation offline like on a call or something or like some you know because it can get misconstrued in texts as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. You I mean, know, there's um, still a lot of quid pro quo going on. And it's like, I'm like, really? Like it's 2021. We're still doing this. Like, you know, I remember when I used to do interviews with athletes and they'd be like, so what do I get? I'm like, you get nothing. Like this is not, right. Like, what are you <laughs> right. talking about? Well, it's I mean, crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, that's just, that, that, that definitely comes with it. You know what I'm saying? And like, you know, again, it's like, you're always going to do that. If you put yourself in a position where you're going to be a public figure in 
a, uh, an industry that's dominated by like the opposite sex. So obviously if you're in, a woman in sports, like, mm-hmm. well, you're going to be dealing with that a lot, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, and it's a weird thing. It's like, I listen, like over the years, like I've had issues with too. Like I produce a lot of singers. Like some of them are like very attractive. Like, so of course. it's like, yo, I mean, I have to like, you know, it's been an issue in my relationships in the past. Like a lot of girls don't like that. It's, it, it's like, you know, it can be, it can make you uncomfortable to even like, Oh, like, do I even want this girl to come through to my studio? Because I know that she's so attractive that like, if I, if, if she posts me or if I, that I'm going to get, you know, people are going to feel a type of way about it. It's not easy, you know, and it's something that people really, really deal with, you know, and it's why in my industry, like relationships have struggles and have issues. Like they just do, you know, it's like, yeah, I was going to say like, where does your love life fit in with all this? But I want to tell you this, this really quick story before we get into that. Um, I wanted to have this guy I saw, I found on TikTok on my podcast and um, he was, he had some really interesting content. And so we hop on a phone call to discuss and like, we talk about it, you know, for like 20 minutes and then he pauses. And I, I talk about this in the podcast all the time, because this is literally every man's way to hit on me. They're like, what ethnicity are you? I'm like, God, I'm like, here we go again. I'm like, God. So <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this is going the wrong way. And like, ever since he's been like calling me every day and now I'm like, well, f- now I can't have you on my podcast. Right. Like, I did not like I I when I commented on his on his content like I did not say oh you're hot I said I would love to have you on my podcast like what about that did you not yeah. comprehend so you're right well the he's showing you right there. there that he's not a like that right away just kind of paints this non-sophisticated sort of thing I yeah. guess is how I look at it like yeah. I mean you know like if, if somebody is that thirsty that they can't even be a vibrant guest without this uncomfortable dynamic around <laughs> stuff it's like horrible yeah you know what I mean I, it's easier as a guy in the industry because women are like raised to not put themselves out there so like, even if a girl is like got a crazy crush on you it's like she's not gonna like rarely is she gonna cross any boundary you know yeah. like or do something to make you uncomfortable right to, you know so it, it is easier in that sense as a guy you know yeah. like mm-hmm. You know, when you're an attractive woman, it's like, it just sucks because it's like every guy is, you know, you guys are raised, we are supposed to, you know, do the first move and hit on the girl. So you just, that's just the way it goes, you know? So going back to your love life, like how, I mean, how do you even have a love life? You're so, first of all, you, from the moment you wake up to the moment you sleep, because I know because you fell asleep texting me last night, how how do you have time to invest in, in your love life? Or is that something that you're just get, like, it's not really at the forefront of your mind right now? No, I mean, um, no, I, I, I definitely put time, you know, into my love life. It's definitely been something that I, that has been like an issue over the years. It has been something that's been it can, it can present challenges, but mm-hmm. I've been able to make it work, you know? And That's like, good. I, yeah, I've been able to make it work. And, um, I, I find that the person I'm seeing right now, she's somebody who really understands what's going on. It hasn't been without struggles though, like around it. It's, you know, like I'm not in the profession that I think is like exactly what she <laughs> saw for herself. I mean, that's right. the biggest issue that I've had in relationships over the years is that they're like, I really am not trying to date a music producer, DJ type, but you're not like, but I really like you so much that like, I'll kind of like put up with it because you bring all this other stuff to the table. And so unfortunately it's kind of, it's kind of the case that I do feel that more often than not that women tolerate the, the public figure side of me. Okay. But I've rarely met a girl that thinks that's so great. Genuinely think that's so great. Very few women are thrilled about the fact that like I have like lots of attractive women that follow me and like comment on my Thanks Instagram. I mean, and that's natural. Yeah. I mean, I get that. I mean, there's an element where I get that too. I mean, I, I you know, I've never, I've always dated girls that are more low key, to be honest. In relationships, I prefer to be the only public figure in the relationship. I there's really you. only room for one of us. And normally it's me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. I actually prefer it when a guy has no social media. I'm fine with that. Exactly. <laughs> totally. I mean, I think everybody naturally does, you know, and I think though, at least for me, you know, I can say, which is not a lie, you know, I can tell my girl like, Hey, look, like, 
girls don't really aggressively pursue men online. They don't. Right. You know, it's, you know, it would be different. Like, you know, girls have said to me, well, like, well, what if I had a hundred thousand followers? Like, would you, you know, I'd be like, no, I wouldn't, no. it wouldn't be the same. It's no. not a quid pro quo. It wouldn't be the same because I guarantee your DMs would not look like my DMs. Like that's just a straight fact. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, like I'll look into my story feed, for example, and I'll see some like amazing, like the beautiful models looking at my story, mm -hmm. but they're not DMing me like, Hey sugar, like, Hey, what's up, babe? Like, but if that was the other way around, if that was the other way around, <laughs> then their DMs would be flooded with messages. Yeah. So, so to be honest, I, I, you know, like I, 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 you know, it's definitely one of those things where it's not the same. And I, I, I that, that's the only time when I have conflict because in my opinion, and, and I can get pushback from people around this, it's not the same dynamic, a popular male figure versus a popular female figure. It's just right. not. It's right. just not the same dynamic. It, you're, you're dealing with a completely different thing. If it was the same, then how come most big Instagram model females have their DMs completely blocked mm -hmm. and their message requests completely blocked and they don't even read them versus like DMs, like if I, when I DM like a big male figure personality person, normally he'll see the DM and tap it right away. Yeah. So that's because women have to put those settings on privacy mode <laughs> I know. Ver way more than guys. That's the point, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I guess the, 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 the long short answer is it's, it's, it's definitely challenging. You know, I seem to find a way to make it work, but <laughs> You know, I'm also somebody who's very independent. So I'm not exactly some, you know, like, obviously I really do like relationships, but um, I'm also somebody as an artist. Um, I'm not a big cohabitor. I like living alone. And I, I, it's very important for me to have my own independent life and my own space where I can mm. do my music and everything. I don't work well being around somebody 24 seven, you know, right. the cohab. So yeah, so that's where it's a challenge. You know, I work from home for the most part. So I think that like for certain relationships, when you, when people have their own lives during the day and they're separate and they're at their offices all day, that it kind of is like, oh, it's so nice to come home after a long day to somebody. But when you're living an entrepreneurial life and you're independent and you're doing like it's just really, really difficult to have a lifestyle like that because yeah. you're just going to feel kind of smothered all the time by anybody. Yeah. It's not a, you know, no matter who it is. So that's very true. And I have the same thing going for me. I, like people like all get asked out and like, sometimes I just don't even want to like leave my little comfort of my, my home. I just don't even want to deal with it. Like, unless it's, I, I unless it's some, someone I already know, I feel like if it's someone, if it's a guy I already know, that's different. I don't have to go out and be interviewed, you know, but if it's like a new date that I feel like I have to go out and make an effort and like talk about myself to where they don't know anything about what I do. Like I have to explain, like, I just want to be like, I'm an accountant at that point. You know, like, I don't want to explain social media. Like my last boyfriend told his family that I sell things online, not sex. That's literally like word for word. What he told them. Oh my God. And I'm like, I, I can't, ex I can't explain these things to you anymore. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got one more question for you. It's a question that I ask um, all the guests on my podcast. Sure. And um, it's, it's that if you were to walk down the street and see 20 year old Zach walking up towards you and you got to go give that buddy a big hug and give him one piece of advice now, you know, at your age now, what would you tell 20 year old Zach? I would have just told him never, never take a break from, from music. Yeah. And, and yeah, never take a break from the music and work harder and put out more stuff because I, I have put out a lot of successful music. Mm -hmm. I think I could have put out even more. I yeah. think I spent a lot of years, um, perfecting my sound and worrying that things weren't good enough mm -hmm. when I should have just flooded the internet. And I, I eventually ended up doing that, but I think I would have done it even sooner right. if I had. I think people, the biggest thing I would say is like, you're ready, go, you know, just go and put stuff out and stop worrying about, you know, that's the thing. I love this quote, getting older is an interesting process in which we become the person we always were supposed to be. Okay. And I okay. think that like, what's so little, what's true about it is like, you know, really when you're 20, like you sh is your time to have the mentality that you have, like say when you're in your thirties, mm -hmm. you know, and, and unfortunately it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work backwards. Right. Right. You know, you know, it's like, 
that's why I love talking to like my older family members, you know, who are like in the 60s and 70s because their, their mind is so refined. We don't pay enough respect to the elderly because we don't realize that it's like, they, to them we're like, oh, they're older now, but it's like, they're actually, they are now like the most sophisticated state of where they are. Mm -hmm. And the 20 year old is this insecure blob who like can't, doesn't believe in themselves. Now some do, some are very blessed to have that young confidence. Yeah. So that would be the main thing I would say to myself is to just go in, you know, at that age. And that was an age where I was very much like, oh, what am I doing? Should I keep doing this business? Should I do music? And I could have continued to do both um, at an accelerated pace, but you know, hindsight is always 2020 is how my father used to tell me, of course, of course, you know? So how can the audience support you and your music? I mean, we, we know about your single that's charting right now. What do you have that's coming up? Yeah, that'd be great for everybody to just, you know, give me a follow and shoot me a DM on Instagram. So I know who you are and I can, I can support what you're doing. Um, and then, uh, yes, yeah, stay tuned for my upcoming singles. I've got an EDM single dropping, um, working on the cover art and all that kind of stuff right now. So that's on the way. And I'm going to be also focusing on some down tempo releases as well with my other artists as well. Um, both ZZ and Sunny have new music coming out and then possibly an EP later in the fall or an album working on that towards the winter. That's so amazing. got a lot of stuff in the works. Yeah. And you know, in the meantime, I'm still really, you know, really excited about fast. It's been going really well. I'm doing new Spotify campaigns. I'll be sharing that as well. Support the playlist that'll all be dropping in the next couple of weeks. Fast is the single, by the way, guys. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Fast is the single that I just dropped. Yes. So uh, that's amazing. Congratulations. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad to be your friend and a part of your life. And thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you did too. <laughs> I loved it. No, no, no. Congrats on the show. I'm really excited for it to drop. And this is thank great. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be I'll be touching base with you shortly. I think I have to post this evening. So I'll be I'll be touching base with you. Let's get us run it up. You already know. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, Steph. Back. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Take care. You too. That's a wrap for this episode of The Luxury Dropout. Make sure to visit stephaniejoplin.com to find all of Steph's episodes, including full podcast descriptions and photos of her guests. Until next time, besties.